to Kathleen Ishmael. Chocolate milkshake, oh please. <laughs> like extra chocolate, thing. How about extra thick? Extra thick, too. You want some malt in it? Oh, I like yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Two vanilla malt. Two vanilla malt. Wait, here, here, This is where you're going for the Miss Congeniality, okay? That's all I ever got. <laughs> oh, no. No, I got it. Were you, wait a minute, were you Miss Georgia? No. Miss Thomasville? No. no. Rose Queen? Queen? No. Yeah, I was Miss Pimento Festival Queen <laughs> in Woodbury, Georgia. There you go. Pimento Festival? That's it. That's the home of Pimentos. Do you Where? know that? Woodbury, Georgia. <laughs> okay. Okay. Standing back. Hi, I'm Barbara Rowland. Welcome to Thomasville, Georgia. We're here in Izzo Pharmacy. Stand back and enjoy the show. What if they want to sit, Barbara? <laughs> oh, or sit. <laughs> Stand back. Stand by. <laughs> At first glance, Thomasville, Georgia doesn't appear to be significantly different from other southern towns. The people seem friendly, the pace of life somewhat slow, and there's the quality of contentment that goes with having known your neighbor not just for years, but for generations. All of this is true for Thomasville, but there's more. This town was built with money, lots of it. In a town of only 20,000 people, Thomasville has seven historic districts. Surrounding the town are 71 plantations, most of them still privately owned, many of them by descendants of the original owners from the turn of the century. Everywhere, the importance of continuity is evident. Thomasville embodies history. From the 100-year-old country club to the 70-year-old radio station, to the 43-year-old billiard academy, where some of the locals have been gathering since they were children. Everyone's country, even when we were kids, we came here. Oh, 35 years ago, even when I was seven years old, my daddy used to bring me in here. Really? Yeah. He'd drink beer and I'd drink coke and eat hot dogs. <laughs> Ah, the hot dogs, or chili dogs to be more precise. They sell almost 500 through that little window every day, and not just to locals either. We had people from all over the place come here. We had some people come in from Tacoma, Washington one day and said, do you know how we know about you? And we said, no, we have no idea. They said, well, we read about you in the Homes and Gardens magazine. He said there was an article there about the plantations for sale in Thomasville. At the end of the article, it said, incidentally, while in Thomasville, don't forget to stop by Broad Street at the Billiard Academy and get their world-famous hot dogs. And she says, here we are from Tacoma, Washington. <laughs> <laughs> and chili dogs aren't the only booming business. Thomas County is one of the leading vegetable-producing areas in the nation, with Thomasville serving as a major farming marketing center. And vegetables aren't the only thing growing. You see, this town loves growing. 
roses. In fact, in April, they go blooming nuts with a festival and a parade to celebrate their favorite flower. It seems like a good place to raise children, or Texas Longhorn cattle if you prefer. People like the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, and the B.F. Goodriches built this town into one that is as unique today as it was back in 1887 when Harper's Bazaar proclaimed it the best winter resort of three continents. Over 100 years later, the residents of Thomasville still maintain that if you're not already here, Thomasville is well worth the trip. Even though this area of the country offered no navigable rivers nor any other easy way to get your crops to market, still, the settlers came. They were drawn by the richness of the land and the warm climate's longer growing season. By the early 1800s, many had come to stay. Thomas County was founded in December of 1825, and the city of Thomas was founded in 1831, and it was settled primarily as the county seat. settled in two different sections. The southern half of our county was settled by, primarily by the aristocracy of the coast. It came here with major slave-owning power and a lot of money because of the Red Hills, the city of here, between here and Tallahassee. And they're called the Tallahassee Red Hills. It's the only really part of Florida. It's one of the richest soils in this area. And it attracted men that had money in their pocket. The northern half of our county was pretty much settled by normal human beings who came here looking for a better life. Another place that's carving, rather cooking its way into Thomasville history books is JB's Barbecue. James Benjamin Jones is the owner, operator, and head cook at JB's. We try to treat every day like opening day, and I think when you do that, you're doing it right, you know. JB's is located just outside Thomasville in an unincorporated area known as Beachton. For the last eight years, JB has been satisfying customers with his delicious dishes, and he says no one ever leaves his place hungry. We don't weigh anything. We call it good portions. And uh, we fix very healthy plates. And uh, I think it's justifiable because we get 99% returns. And I haven't heard one person come through the door yet to leave here and said they were still hungry. If anything, they're taking part of it home with them. JB is a 20-year veteran of the U.S. Army where he served as a Green Beret. But before his Army career, he grew up in South Georgia on the Susina Plantation where his father had cooked for nearly 60 years. So before he left to begin his career in the Army, he knew practically all there was to know about South Georgia barbecue. And I went to school for a little while and I decided I wanted to do something where we could work together. So I know that he was in the food business for all these years and I decided to open up a barbecue place because I had uh, cooked for most of my life, but not in the military, just, you know, cooked around and observed him cooking. And uh, I started a little JB's about three blocks from where we're at now. JB begins his day at about 6 a.m. He says he cooks about 300 to 900 pounds of meat every day. Now, you know, it's shrinking. You have what's what called shrinking. A lot of places don't know how to cook the thick part, they just cook the thin part. But he doesn't limit himself to just cooking. JB doesn't do everything, though. He has a large staff to take care of a lot, including nearly all of his family, plus a hired staff of about 25 people to serve his loyal customers. And what customers they are. Everybody who's anybody has been through JB's. I just like people's, and I don't think you could be in any other business and have such different people coming all the time from movie stars to Russians. I done had people from uh, Yugoslavia, Denmark, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, heads of state, uh, Governor Charles been in a few times. One of JB's friends is another JB, Jimmy Buffett. That's right, the Jimmy Buffett, known for his Caribbean rock music. He's a neighboring plantation owner and a frequent JB's customer. Jimmy Buffett's been a friend of mine for two years, and when he's in town, he, uh, him and his daughter always stops in. Savannah, they always stops in, and uh, 
So he's a good friend of mine, and in the last time he was here, he brought his whole band up here to the place before they had the concert that night. And then uh, whenever he knows him, he's a great fan also of B.B. King, so when he's, when he's near, he always arranged for Ruth and I to go backstage and meet B.B. King. JB says the personal touch is what keeps his business booming. He says he's never done a bit of advertising, just word of mouth. I think that one-on-one -on -one contact was really the selling point uh, because a lot of the grandmothers said I have spoiled their kids. Uh, they tell them, so let's run over to McDonald's, and they said, no, let's go up to JB. So pay attention to detail, which I do very Sometimes my wife tells me I'm not still in the Army, you know, but uh, I like to run a tight ship. JB's has been open for many years, and he says if he has his way, that won't change for quite some time. I hope my kids, and I have four gorgeous grandboys, I hope, uh, they're quite small now, but uh, I want to see my son and daughter and husband and wife take over, and. JB, I will always be at the pit until I can't go anymore. <laughs> I will be there forever, I think. <laughs> My wife said I'll probably drop dead at the pit, <laughs> but uh, I hope not. <laughs> I don't need to fight, just A few of the early settlers to Thomasville were the second and third sons of the North's landed gentry, whose family inheritances had gone to older brothers. They built the more than 70 plantations that, for the most part, are still here a century and a half later. Of course, one of the things that's the most unique about Thomas is none of our plantations should be here again. We keep all the water in each kind of market, and theoretically we won't have them. But the Red Hills between here and Tallahassee attracted men that had money, and the capital of Florida had a railroad. So if you get your, get your cotton to Tallahassee, you can get your cotton to England. And therefore, a rather odd and interesting thing, only 10% of the South ever owned five slaves, and only 25% of the South owned any slaves at all. Well, in Thomas, only 9% of Thomas ever owned a slave. Out of the 4,400 whites in the county, 410 men owned a slave, but they owned 6,300 of them, which made us one of the largest slave owning counties in the entire South. Okay. You don't have to read it. You can read it. Okay. Because of the work of Thomasville artist Marty Haythorne, we are able to revive pieces of a culture that flourished in these parts about 3,500 years ago. photographic reproductions of the artifacts, each piece is reconstructed by hand and then cast. When it comes out of the mold, the incised work and the decoration also must be done by the hand of the artist, just as it was thousands of years ago. Most of the pieces that I do uh, were used in, in various 
various uh, ceremonies and rituals, um, primarily mortuary rituals. These were buried with people uh, who were important to the community. And the cutouts represent um, ceremonial uh, sacrifices. Uh, instead of sacrificing an animal, they'd use a piece of pottery. Um, they just had a very, very strong connection with uh, uh, people who had passed away and felt that there was a, another world that these people went to. Marty says he gathers his raw material, the clay, the same way the Indians must have, from creek beds and river banks and often from along the side of the road. I usually uh, uh, play with the formula a little bit to, to make sure that the clay doesn't shrink too much or, or it doesn't uh, crack in the firing. Close study of the shards and other remnants reveals that originally the clay was tempered with fibers that would give it some strength in the shrinking process to prevent cracking. But as the art form developed, they began mixing sand with it and were able to achieve the same results. Uh, I'm trying to get as close to the way the Indians did it as possible, so I dig a pit, uh, pile the pieces up, um, and then build a, a ring of fire around the pieces and uh, slowly bring them up to temperature uh, by building fire closer and closer to them until it's, it completely covers the pieces and I've got a, a huge bonfire. You know, we're, we're coming up on the 500th anniversary of, of the European discovery of America and I feel that uh, as we celebrate that discovery for the Europeans, uh, we should also honor uh, what was lost for the American Indians. And this is part of a culture uh, that is lost. There aren't any mountain builders anymore. Eventually, I, uh, I think I would like to revive the tradition, uh, revive the style, and uh, do some, some original pieces based on, on that, that style. In the years following the Civil War, doctors believed that this warm, pie-scented air had the power to alleviate tuberculosis. Many wealthy patients were sent to Thomasville to recuperate, and almost overnight, the place became a popular vacation resort for the super rich. The resort era of 70 to 1900 had to have been a uh, period where the average man wouldn't have traveled at all. So almost every one of our visitors that came here were well to do, filthy. Uh, the B.F. Goodriches of this world, the Cornelius Vanderbilts, the Rockefellers, they came to Thomasville for that period in that period of time. Uh, this particular building, of course, is where William McKinney becomes president. Mark Hanna, the political boss of his day, brings the governor of Ohio down for the vacation. When the smoke cleared, he had the nomination. And he promised us if he was elected, he'd come back to see us. Now, he may be the only politician in history ever kept his word. Bless his heart. That's President McKinley standing on the front porch of that house in 1899. Of course, Eisenhower came all the time with his president. He'll come here five times in a row by the press. Jimmy's Bend. Uh, this is the Duke of Windsor, who was, of course, the King of England. Gave up his throne for the woman he loved. And of course, Jackie also came to Thomasville two or three times, but this was her first visit, and it was to Thomasville that Jackie came to hide. She came to get away from the press, and she was at Greenwood for about six weeks before anybody in Thomasville knew she was here. Just after the turn of the century, when the true causes of malaria and yellow fever were discovered, South Florida was open for settlement, and Thomasville's boom time resort era abruptly ended. But it left this place with a distinctive charm that has never stopped attracting resourceful people. You know, there was a time when people thought this would be the future of small town America, strip malls and shopping centers. They said downtown businesses would have to take a back seat to convenience stores. Called it progress. That's not what people in Thomasville say. We think our downtown is uh, vital. We feel like we are the heart of the community. And if we lose our downtown, um, I think it, it uh, reaches out into the entire community. Unfortunately, shopping malls were doing a number on downtown Thomasville. 
Shop owners tried to fight back by modernizing their businesses. They took the Victorian architecture of Thomasville's resort era and covered it with aluminum. They had an awful lot of metal modern buildings and that was the way, you know, it was new and it was in, in, in supposedly permanent and it was great at the time but it really is not lasting for a town. Having recognized that revitalizing a downtown meant more than just decorating a storefront, Thomasville turned to the Main Street program. Established in April of 1982, Main Street used a four-point approach, organize the efforts of civic and business leaders, promote the activities of the downtown and its merchants, and provide economic restructuring to the district. But it's the fourth point, design, that really caught Thomasville's attention. Main Street could do all this economic development within the context of historical preservation. I love the design part of the program because that's actually peeling the metal and the aluminum off of these buildings when they were covered up so flagrantly in the 60s. And it reveals the beautiful architectural beauty, the, the um, hidden brick and so forth, all of the things that make the building unique. We tried to go back to the original, and luckily we have wonderful photographs of the buildings, so we actually see the detail of the building and, and, and show that to the owner and say, does this appeal to you? And those pictures with all that detail, you know, come out just great, and they say, gosh, can it ever look that way again? What do you think about this? I think that looks real good, then, good. especially where you change the different colors, what brings out the, the artwork or mm -hmm, whatever you might say, mm -hmm. architectural design right. of the That's building. And I, I think it looks a facelift for a building can be expensive, but downtown businesses like Thomas Drugstore do get a financial incentive to participate. The Main Street uh, group paid 50% of redoing the front of your store, and it got a lot of stores redone, repainted, old awnings taken off, and canvas awnings put on that made it look more like it did around the turn of the century. Every time somebody takes pride in their building and redoes it to the specifications that Main Street sets up, I think that's the whole plan. We're trying to keep Thomasville and, you know, remind people of what it was years ago so that when our children grow up, they can enjoy it the way we do. I think that's the whole plan. The best thing about the Main Street program is preserving our rich past, our wonderful history, and getting the community to all pull together and work on a revitalized downtown. There are over 600 Main Street programs across the country, and Main Street Thomasville is one of the oldest and most successful of those projects. Still, they'll be one of the first to tell you that they have a ways to go yet. But what they've done so far should remind us of one simple thing, that progress doesn't mean you have to forget your roots. We like to think of ourselves as modern and uh, moving into the future, but we love our past, and no one in Thomasville is willing to let go of it. Now, Granny Zabner, I believe that's our ring. I know his Lum, I believe you're right. Now, see. Hello, John M. Down store. This is Lum and Abner. It's not 1932, it's 1992, and this classic radio program is being rebroadcast on WPAX Radio, an AM station in Thomasville that's been playing the oldies since the oldies were new. We try to play something that if you're listening to PX sometime within the hour, you will say, I haven't heard that song in ages. This station today sounds to me a lot like it, it must have sounded in the mid-50s. Uh, you, you don't hear very many stations programming Lum and Abner. You can't turn on very many radio stations and hear Duke Ellington. Uh, you, you don't hear the types of things on other stations that you hear on this one. While a lot of radio stations are now playing the so-called oldies, WPAX can actually lay claim to being one. It became the 20th radio station in the nation, 
when a man named Hoyt Wimpy, an auto mechanic with a penchant for building radio receivers, applied for and received a license for WPAX back in 1922. He actually, from what I understand, got the license not because he wanted to get into the radio business, but because he wanted to sell radios. He had a radio shop around the corner called Wimpy Radio, and he made radio sets. The problem was there were no local or even regional stations to tune into. So Wimpy was forced to create a market for his product. Working out of his garage, Wimpy put his station on the air with only a homemade 10-watt transmitter. A far cry from the 50,000 watts of some stations today, but still strong enough to reach clear across the country. It went tremendous distances, not by virtue of the power, but by virtue of the fact that there were no interfering frequencies out there. And we have postcards from Philadelphia, all over the, the, the southern or southeast United States, well, not even just the southeast, but the eastern United States of people receiving, you know, the signal. According to this letter, on at least one very clear night, a surprise listener from the South Island of New Zealand was even able to tune into the station. While the broadcast of nostalgic programming has helped maintain a loyal audience, it's the commitment to daily coverage of local news, sports, and community events that has kept WPAX in the game for the past 70 years. And this at a time when many AM stations are losing the battle for advertising dollars to FM broadcasters. Let's go to the Waffle Shop, 113 North Crawford Street in Thomasville. Today they've got fried chicken, hamburger steak, veal, I had a fellow say the other day that, that uh, and I thought this was one of the highest compliments he could pay, would be, he said that uh, if, if, he, if you want to know what's going on in Thomasville, tune, on, tune to WPAX, and that's what we strive to do, mm -hmm. just to let you know what's happening. And in the meantime, we play good music. Georgia. Be sure and stay tuned next time when the postcards crew travels to Quincy, Florida. From all of us here at Izzo Pharmacy in Thomasville, Georgia, the City of Roses, I'm Barbara Rowland saying good night.